Clark Atlanta University Center for Cancer Research and Therapeutic Development. I'm Andrea Coleman and I will serve as your moderator for the next 90 minutes as we take a look at the health of the black male. I am joined today by a distinguished panel of guests who will help guide today's discussion. And when introducing them, I will begin with my left, my immediate left. So please welcome Dr. Shafiq Khan, who as Executive Director of the CCRTD has committed time and energy into programs such as this one to help the community remain informed of medical advances and alerts. Dr. Khan is a scientific director of the CCRTD and also holds the position of eminent scholar in the cancer cell biology at Clark Atlanta University, an endowed chair funded by the Georgia Research Alliance. In addition, he is a director of the NIH NIH MHD Center for Excellence in Prostate Cancer Research, Education, and Community Services. And to Dr. Khan's immediate left, please welcome Dr. Leroy Reese. Dr. Reese is a research associate professor at Morehouse School of Medicine, which is right next door, and the Department of Community Health and Preventive Medicine. Prior to joining the School of Medicine at Morehouse, Dr. Reese was a senior scientist and team leader at the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention at the National Center for Injury Prevention and Control. Dr. Reese conducts community-based health research focused on the development of healthy lifestyles, the reduction of risk behaviors in under-resourced communities, and the modification of community-based social determinants of health. Recently, he served as the task force of, or on the task force of the American Psychological Association that produced a report, Resilience and Strength in African American Children and Adolescents. Dr. Reese has served as a consultant to the National Institute of Mental Health, National Institute of Health or Child Health and Human Development, and the CDC. Dr. Reese lives here in the metro Atlanta area and is extremely active in the local community. Welcome, Dr. Reese. We're so happy to, to have you with us today. Thank you. Our next panelist sitting on Dr. Reese's immediate left, please welcome Dr. Camille Reagan. Dr. Reagan currently serves as an associate professor in the Cancer Prevention and Control Program at Fox Chase Cancer Center in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Her research focus has been on cancer epidemiology and cancer prevention in minority populations. In 2006, Dr. Reagan established the African American, or African, pardon me, because it's global, African Caribbean Cancer Consortium, a research group designed to promote collaboration between cancer researchers who focus their work in populations of African ancestry. A Caribbean native of Jamaica, Dr. Reagan has had firsthand experience and relates to the lack of quality and preventative health care and education in minority populations. Her interest in infectious diseases and the field of public health inspired her to pursue a career in medical or biomedical research. And in the year of 2000, Dr. Reagan earned a PhD in infectious diseases and microbiology from the University of Pittsburgh Graduate School of Public Health. We're so happy that you could join us today, Dr. Thank Reagan. You. We look forward to hearing more about the consortium. And we are also extremely grateful and pleased to have with us Dr. John Michael Underwood, who joins us as a panelist today. Dr. Underwood is an epidemiologist in the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention's Division of Cancer Prevention and Control. He joined the CDC in July 2009 as an Epidemic Intelligence Service Officer, that sounds really technical, on the Scientific Support and Clinical Translation Team in the Division of Cancer Prevention and Control's Comprehensive Cancer Control Branch. His research interests include examining trends in cancer incidents assessing needs among the growing population of cancer survivors and evaluating improvements in cancer treatment. Dr. Underwood attended Tuskegee University as an undergraduate where he earned a Bachelor in Science in Biology. He received a doctorate in Pharmacology at the University of Minnesota Twin City where he also studied public health and epidemiology. And so we are so welcome to have you here and as you can tell, we do have an expert panel today, and we're so happy that we do. Before we get started, though, we'd also like to take a moment and just have Dr. Khan, if you would, Dr. Khan, uh, talk a little bit about the importance of this topic and what you're hoping we will accomplish in these 90 minutes. Well, you know, at, at our center, we focus on prostate cancer and especially its impact in the African-American community. But if you look at the health of a black male or African-American male in this country and look at the different diseases, HIV or diabetes or um, um, any disease you pick up and somehow the African-American males are, are affected by it more than anybody else. If you look at the death rate, the African-American males die at a higher rate than anybody else and at a younger age. 
and and we're not talking about the, the violence and other issues it's just the health issues mm -hmm. so what we wanted to do today was to bring out a conversation about this issue and see what is going on what's the reason behind it and then what are the solutions what are we supposed to be doing what we're not doing so that's my my, my goal today and mm -hmm. thank you for hosting it again for You're us. You're more than welcome, Dr. Khan. Dr. Reese, let me start with you, especially sure. with your framework coming from the, as a community advocate, if you will. Mm. Um, when you talk about it, when you think about the black male health uh, today, considering how much attention has been given it or lack thereof, mm -hmm. are you pleased with what you're hearing or do you feel like there's more that needs to be done? Well, I'm disappointed. Um, I, I'm, I'm disappointed for a variety of reasons. And one of the reasons is, Back in the 60s, there was a um, book called Black Rage uh, by Cobb and Greers that spoke to the conditions affecting African-American males. Um, and here we are some 50 plus years later, and uh, a, a strong argument can be made that the conditions affecting African-American, in particular their health, haven't um, improved. In fact, they deteriorated. As Dr. Khan mentioned, that um, black men die at disproportionate rates for a variety um, of health outcomes. And, and, and so I think that we are missing an important opportunity. And I think the opportunity with respect to the African American community is this. Um, the health of African American males is inextricably tied to the health of the African American community, much like that of the African American female. And, 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 and so if we are to be whole and that we are to be productive, um, health is tied to education, education is tied to employment, employment is tied to quality of life. And, and so I think that as we look at ways that we can uh, enhance the well-being of the African-American community, that we have to be holistic, and I think that we need to be intentional in the efforts that we direct towards the improving the health of African-American males. Yeah, and, and if you don't mind, I want to just piggyback sure. on that a little bit when talking about the CCRTD because it's very unique in that it has taken its research funding and put it specifically toward the black male. And that's why we're actually doing the, the, the state of the black male health or the health of the black male today. We don't want women to feel like we're not including you. <laughs> we are. Uh, but from the CCRTD's perspective, that black male health is very important. And so it's quite unique to see a, a center uh, a research center actually dedicates so much time and energy to make certain the community is not only informed, uh, very, very much engaged and prepared to handle uh, the issue as much as it, it, it can. So Dr. Reagan, with that, uh, you're coming kind of from a global perspective with that uh, African-Caribbean consortium. Your thoughts on the state of the, the health of the black male? I, I think I will have to echo what um, uh, Dr. Reese has just said um, in terms of uh, the major concerns that we have with respect to men's health. Um, we are pretty far behind when, when we think about um, you know, gender differences and, and specifically I, I can relate um, primarily to cancer. Um, when we look at the incidence of cancer in black men globally, there is a much big difference, um, not just between races, but also between gender. And so there's a lot that really needs to be done. Not to say that a lot has not been accomplished, but I think we, ha we still have a long way to go. Right. And, and when looking at that, especially uh, Dr. Underwood, for some people, uh, and I know we've been doing the town hall meeting now for seven years, the CCR, C, uh, uh, CCR TD has been around for 10 years, and so it seems sometimes like there's an abundance of information getting out there, but yet we're not seeing the outcomes that I think a lot of people were hoping that kind of energy and attention uh, would yield. Dr. Underwood, your thoughts on that? Where do we stand today, and where might we be, you know, uh, where might the, the, the lack be as far as getting that black male to engage and any other kind of disparities that we may be seeing? I agree, <coughs> excuse me. And with a lot of things, it's not just that the information is available, it's where does that information go? Mm -hmm. So I'm gonna echo what Dr. Reagan just said. Um, a lot of people may not know that black men have the highest cancer incidence and the highest cancer mortality than any other subgroup in the, in the United States. Um, that's a very intriguing situation where you have this very clear disparity, um, yet the mass majority of the population is not aware of that. Um, if you were to ask you know, a typical lay person, they may not tell you that, they may not know that. So until um, we actually are aware of the situation and we can start moving to improve it, we won't see those type of outcomes that we actually need to see to improve the health of the black man, especially from a cancer perspective. 
Yeah, we actually have a guest from the media today, so if we don't, if we can, we'd love to go ahead and bring in DeMarco Morgan, uh, who is an anchor here, uh, well, is an anchor in Atlanta at WXIA 11 Alive, and he joins us, or he gives us the news every evening, I think at 6 and 11, and uh, so welcome, DeMarco. We're so happy to, to have you here, and as we're talking about information, we'd love to get your thoughts about the media's, uh, I guess, the media's role and, and how, uh, uh, a, a system like the CCRTD or researchers, people who have this abundance of information can access those airwaves and make certain that that information is getting out to as broad a population as possible. I, well, first I want to say thank you uh, for having me today. I also teach at Clark Atlanta, so oh, it's good to good. be home. Uh, <laughs> back on this side of uh, things, the TV side of things. But uh, the media's role is extremely important, especially when you have African-American men who are in anchor roles or reporter roles. Uh, people see us, brothers see us, and they need to see that we're also taking care of ourselves. When I first uh, moved here from New York, I was invited upstairs and told that, hey, you're gonna be the face of prostate cancer. And I didn't have it, uh, thank God, didn't know anyone that had uh, prostate cancer. But they said, you're gonna be the face. The next thing was, we want you to wear a gown <laughs> in a commercial, and I said, I'm about to put on a gown <laughs> in a commercial. But it was so important, and I didn't realize the importance until I uh, went out in the community. We do the, uh, the Wear the Gown uh, mm -hmm. ca campaign, and it's basically to educate men and tell brothers, also white men, uh, men period, to go get checked uh, for prostate cancer. But there was a, a young lady uh, that I ran into. She was in her mid, probably 40s, uh, mm -hmm. late uh, 50s, or early 50s, I should say. And she said, my husband was watching that commercial he laughed and then he went to get checked and you saved his life because wow. he was diagnosed with prostate cancer. So at that moment, I knew that what I was doing was much bigger than just putting on a gown and being afraid to put on this gown or whatever for fear yeah. of what people would say or whatever. But um, even with that said, I just recently got tested and I'm only 35 years old and went to get checked because somebody said, you wear the gown, you do the commercials, but have you ever been tested? And here I am telling everybody to go get checked. Right. And I was afraid yeah. to get on the table for the discomfort for just a couple of seconds. <laughs> and I uh, went to get checked out and thank God everything uh, worked out pretty well. But it is so important for brothers to show up to the doctor. We just don't go for some reason. Right. And I think That's it has a lot to do with pride. It has a lot to do with ego. I lost my father when I was 10 years old and uh, he died of uh, lung cancer, but he had a lot of ailments going on. And I'm pretty sure he had some other stuff that he didn't want to share, but it was because he didn't go to the doctor. And he would sometimes lie to my mom. Yeah. That's and say that he would go, you yeah. know, get check up. So it's important what we do, and uh, I, I love being the face of it now. That's very good. Well, if we can, let's talk a little bit about that. How, uh, we know, actually, I guess I'm saying we know, and I'm talking from the perspective of the CCRTD and the town hall meetings that we've had in the past, but that doctor-patient relationship is so very critical, especially for young men. Yeah. And I would like to believe that young men, men that are, you know, 35 years and younger would know that by now because they came up in the information age. But if DeMarco, an educated young African-American male is just now stopping and realizing its importance, um, what, I know it's great he went, but does that concern you at all that it's taken so long to get him into that mode or someone like him who is young, black, and educated? Dr. Reagan, I see you nodding your head. It is a big concern, and, and I, I think, um, you know, I, and I don't know this answer or the solution to how to, to, to change that, um, but I, I think that maybe one starting place would be to have that conversation more often than it currently is being made, and to make it more public, more of a public conversation, um, you know, rather than just simply assuming that African American males should know this is what they need to do. And I think in the past, too, it's been stressed that the women uh, in the lives of those males play a critical role in that. Moms, get those children into the yeah. doctor's office, train them to go, yeah. train them to look for the doctor. Uh, wives, schedule the appointments for them. Yeah. And then last year, one of our guests had a wonderful idea. He said sometimes when the wife can't get them to do what they need to do, the daughter can. It's a different kind of relationship. Yes. So and I think, Dr. Reese, you had a very, very interesting take on that as well. You said the woman is very important, but there's some peer-to-peer -peer communications that could go on as well. Well, there are, and, 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 and so as a, as a backdrop, you know, I, I think the role of primary care is, is, is critical. You know, I had the same pediatrician until I was 14 years 
old, and so I went to see Dr. Stone every year, and there was something wrong with me. I had a relationship with him. We were talking about the doctor-patient uh, relationship, and then I, I went off to college, and then it was working with, uh, you know, athletic doctors and, and, and these, these kinds of things. But then somewhere in my 20s, I didn't have a relationship with a primary care doc. You know, if I got mm -hmm. sick, I might go. I'm, I'm healthy then. I don't, I don't think that there's anything wrong with me. I think that I'm invincible, um, et cetera. And, and so we don't normalize this idea of the importance of having relationships with, uh, doc, with, with your physician. The other part that's related to that um, is the access to primary care. You know, you went at 35 because you have health insurance. And I think that one of the reasons where we see the biggest disparities is among um, poor African American men who oftentimes don't have access to primary care. And so one of the things is normalizing. Another th part of it is, is, is um, access to, to health care. But I think in terms of the, um, the, the peer to peer piece, um, I think we have to get black men talking to black men about why it's important that we take care of ourselves. We have to um, talk through why we have to go um, get a prostate exam. We have to see a Steve Harvey on, on the uh, ACS commercial he did a couple of years ago where they showed him getting a colonoscopy. We have to do those kinds of things to normalize um, that it's masculine uh, for us to take <coughs> care of ourselves. That actually, um, in fact, the masculine thing to do is to take care of ourselves so that we can take care of our, our, of our families, et cetera. So I, I think that the wives and, and daughters play an important role, but I think increasingly we as men have to play a leading role in terms of getting other brothers to go, go to the doctor. And then following up with them, hey man, you said you were going to, to get such and such checked out. Did you, did you follow up? What, what were the results? You know, do you need any support? Do you need me to go with you? <clears throat> That's very good, Dr. Well, I wanted to say something, but DeMarcus said that he's thir only 35 years old mm -hmm. and he got it checked. I think that is one of the, the major problems as well, but most men think that it's an old man's mm -hmm. disease and you, you're not supposed to go when you're so young. But we, you know, we have seen patients at 33 years of age with full-blown prostate cancer, especially if you have a history in the family of cancer, and especially prostate cancer. So, so I think that that myth is also there that, you know, I'm too young to get a cancer yet, so I don't have to worry about it. Mm -hmm. So we have to somehow nullify that myth, too. And that's one of the reasons why I was so uh, hesitant about going, because I thought I had time on my side. I could wait until I was 40 or, or 45 or 50 to go get checked because that's what you hear. Oh, it's just an old guy's you know, mm -hmm. disease or something like that. So uh, when I actually went to go get tested, he said it's a good thing that you came in here, yeah. especially being an African-American uh, male. And Jerry Carnes, uh, one of my coworkers who's a reporter, he was diagnosed with uh, prostate cancer five years ago. He beat it, he's a survivor, but he lost his father. But he did a story earlier this year with an African-American male who was diagnosed uh, with prost cancer, uh, prostate cancer with an aggressive form yeah. at 36 years old exactly. and the yes. light bulb just went off and even the, the, the black men, the brothers in the newsroom were like, wow, yes. we can get it. You really can and. Especially you know, with the family history. That's, and we're gonna discuss genetics coming up next. <laughs> what role do genetics play when it comes to the onset of disease and how important is it that African American men pay attention to their medical, their family medical history? We'll have more in just a moment, stay with us. Welcome back to the seventh annual town hall meeting sponsored by Clark Atlanta University Center for Cancer Research and Therapeutic Development. Our focus this year is the health of the black male. One of the questions we're looking at is the role genetics play in the onset of disease. And is there anything a person, in particular a black male, can do to offset any inherited predisposition to disease? Our panelists today include Dr. Leroy Reese, a research associate professor at Morehouse School of Medicine in the Department of Community Health and Preventive Medicine, Dr. Camille Reagan, an associate professor in the Cancer Prevention and Control Program at Fox Chase Cancer Center in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, and she's also the founder of the African Caribbean Cancer Consortium, a research group designed to promote collaboration between cancer researchers who focus their work in populations of African ancestry and also Dr. John Michael Underwood, an epidemiologist in the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention's Division of Cancer Prevention and Control, and the esteemed leader of the CCRTD, the host organization of this forum, Dr. Shafiq Khan. So if you don't mind, Dr. Underwood, you've been a little quiet so far, so we're gonna bring you in a little bit. Talk a little bit about the role genetics play on the onset of disease, and how important is it 
um, for African American males, well, black males, mm -hmm. because we're going to take this from a global perspective, um, to pay attention to their family medical history. Absolutely. <laughs> so before my current life in public health, I, I was actually trained as a pharmacologist. And in that capacity, I focused a lot on genetics and cancer outcomes specifically. Um, genetics do play a, ma a very major part in developing all types of diseases, especially cancer. Um, because I focus so much on cancer, um, I do a lot of research within lung cancer. And I can tell you that the smoking prevalence um, is directly connected to lung cancer incidence, correct? We all know that smoking causes cancer. Um, within black males, we see that there's no real difference between smoking prevalence in black males and other groups. However, the lung cancer incidence in black males is much higher than other groups. That leads us to believe that there's either something going on as far as the t tobacco products in question specifically or the actual tobacco use behavior, but more likely also some type of genetic um, factor in play as well. So um, genetics are a very major part of any disease development, especially cancer. Um, we know that. We need to do more research, the type that Dr. Khan is actually doing here at Clark Atlanta, um, to further evaluate that, to get more answers and make more interventions. Uh, Dr. Reagan, what are you finding? Um, and, and I know that your con the consortium, the African Caribbean Consortium, is fairly new and fairly young. Uh, but, but so far in your studies, especially as it relates to prostate cancer, how important is that family medical history? It is extremely important because similarly for prostate cancer, there's a very strong um, um, family history linked to some, um, some proportions of prostate cancer that's developed in black um, men. Um, you know, it's very often when I'm in the community doing educational sessions or recruiting for studies when we talk to black men and you, oftentimes it's very, um, very easy for them to say, you know, my father was diagnosed with prostate cancer or my brother just had prostate cancer. It's not an unusual thing to hear that. So it does um, indicate that there, there is a very strong um, family history component and that is something that we do need to look at and that's tied to, to ge the genetics mm -hmm. of, of the individual. Do they understand what they're saying and the, the import of what they're saying when they're saying my father had prostate cancer or died of prostate cancer, do they understand that means that they have been impacted, they sit in a different, a different category than a general population? I think for the most part, the, some, most men do recognize that. Um, you know, when they see things running, diseases running through families, you know, oftentimes you will automatically believe that, yes, I am at risk because it's in my family. And so it, it's not unusual um, to see those men recognize the importance of uh, family history. Um, I think what needs to be more um, disseminated to the general black African American community is that knowledge. Not all men may realize that family history plays a very strong role for prostate cancer. And I think that message may need to be, you know, disseminated a little bit better. And, and Dr. Reese, talk a little bit about how that information is disseminated. You just mentioned that the, the, the populations that are most impacted usually are those that are either in or close to poverty. Mm -hmm. If mm -hmm. that's the case, do we need to study the communication methods and patterns that are going to that community? I mean, are we talking too broad sometimes? Are we talking too general? Or do you find that it's a matter really of just reaching them? Or, I mean, what are the factors that come into play? So as an initial observation, I think it's talking to them. Um, I don't think we, we talk to people, so it is important to know the family history because it puts you at risk, whether you're talking about um, certain cancer sites or cardiovascular disease or uh, other types of things. The other thing that's related to that, though, is that if you know that, then we have lifestyle modification that you can engage in. So you know what? I need to um, be mindful of what I eat. I need to manage my stress. I need to be physically active, I need to do this, I need to do that. And so we have to help them understand that not only having this information about the hist family history, because you can know it, and you might think, well, I'm going to die from prostate cancer because you know I've had three generations of men in my family who did that. No, there are three generations who have been affected by it. What can I do differently? And so I think that's the place that we have to engage folks, and we have to figure out, um, we had a conversation about speaking common language, and so we have to kind of <coughs> Um, talk with them about um, why the greens got to be made a little different. 
you know, um, than, than, than we have, how, how we used to make them. Are you telling us to take the fork out? <laughs> <laughs> you know, <laughs> you know, Be uh, careful, doctor. I know, I know, I know. <laughs> Thanksgiving is coming up and, you know. Or how um, do you fry your chicken? <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, but we have to have important <clears throat> and critical conversations because um, it, it, does the pork do it for me or does being here do it for me? Um, so I'd, I'd rather be here to raise my babies than, uh, than uh, eat well, good. You know, and sometimes that brings in tradition. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, I know in my family, you know, I hear all the time how so-and-so did this, how my grandmother did this, how, and so some of that, there's an affection there that takes us, takes us to another place emotionally. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I don't know if that's a, a, something to consider or ponder, but uh, I find it interesting that sometimes those are hard to tweak. Well, create new traditions or modify the traditions. You don't have to change the, the, the preparation of, of the food. You might just change some of the ingredients that, that are in the food. Um, you know, there's a project in um, the Black Belt in, in Alabama where uh, this church congregation, they came up with all the old Southern favorites prepared healthily. Mm -hmm. And, and it, because it happened in a church, they prepared these cookbooks that they then disseminated to, to the congregants of the church. And so the, the, church, the meal that you have at church after the service mm -hmm. were prepared using that cookbook and people were kind of talking about how good the food was. Mm -hmm. And so you normalize uh, better and healthier behavior. That's very good. And, and when speaking about communication, we do have a special guest here, and he doesn't have a whole lot of time, but he's giving us as much as he can, and that's DeMarco <laughs> Morgan from uh, 11 Alive News. And so, DeMarco, I'd love to hear, if you could actually, we want to put you in the expert seat for a moment. How, oh. <laughs> but how does a center like the CCRTD or the African Caribbean Consortium, how do they take their work and make it a value to a news program, a mainstream news program, like a, an 11 Alive news program? Where, how do they access you, and at what point does that information become valuable enough that you're going to pick it up? You know what? You have to pick up the phone and uh, build a relationship. A lot of times you have assistants who have assistants who reach out to people in the media and mm -hmm. their phone calls are just not returned. But if you have power like mm -hmm. these doctors, pick up the phone call and say, hey, let me speak to DeMarco. Let's go to lunch. Let's figure out how we can work together. Uh, a lot of times we have conversations like that, but unfortunately some people never follow through. Mm -hmm or they want something done right then and there. And we're following breaking news because there's been a, uh, God forbid, a plane crash somewhere and there's this sort of, oh, well, he didn't call me back, so I won't fool with him. I, I think there has to be that, that good follow-up and we have a responsibility as a media. I, uh, I have a responsibility as an African-American male. I get tired of seeing young brothers who are shot and killed and reporting about black suspects and black victims for the first six, seven minutes uh, during a newscast, but yet we don't say anything about educating our brothers when it comes to their health or talking about our brothers who are being educated and who are doing a great thing. So I think it's also about having that voice at the table and having someone who can be your voice, uh, this center's voice, and say, hey, this is what we need to do. Have we thought about creating a campaign with Clark Atlanta. And I think that's how you make it happen, personally. I want to come back to you, if you don't mind, in just mm -hmm. a moment, to talk about time frame. Okay. Uh, when does that relationship, when does that first call need to take place in regards to any event that someone may be having and how do they package the information? So, um, do you have enough time to yes. think? Okay, yeah. perfect, perfect. Well, I think I would already say that he should consider that I've already made that call. Okay, <laughs> <laughs> okay so we're going we're gonna to consider that for, if you'll also tell Dr. Khan now that the initial call has been made between you and he, what he needs to do to follow up to take it to the third. I think it's a lunch, Dr. Khan, if yeah. I'm not mistaken. Okay. Okay. Lunch, <laughs> and, and I'll tell you something, a lunch, beside the fact that I love to eat, a, the lunch is like the most important uh, thing to do because you connect to face. A lot of times we get these press releases that are so wordy and so long and technology that we don't understand because we're not experts like you guys. We didn't go to medical school. I know for a fact I didn't even uh, have an opportunity to go to medical school. But I, I think when you build those relationships, you sort of feel obligated. Uh, to help mm -hmm. and you also can stress to me the importance of knowing that it could be me yes it could very well be me or it could be my son it could be my father it could be my brother so I, I think having that relationship having that lunch and understanding the responsibility and then holding my feet to the fire no, I, I'm and making sure that I, I do agree it, and that the important. next thing for us is to decide when and where and We'll, we'll go. I like the way you move. <laughs> you know, and now you've just got a new best friend. Yes, so, ma'am. Yes. Yes, ma uh, yeah, but I do want to go back to something you said, and I'd love to hear our, our, our panelists discuss this a little bit. 
When it does come to the news, when it comes to information regarding the black male in this society, it is so very often negative. It is overwhelming to watch the news these days. And I have three teenage sons, so I watch it with my breath held most days and pray that they're not going to one day be one of the people that's before that camera. Because if they are, if they're not delivering the news, chances are the report's not going to be good. How does that impact the psyche of the black male? And how does that impact his level of trust regarding the receipt of information that may be coming through those airwaves? Dr. Underwood? It, it has a major impact. Um, <clears throat> so a, a few things are happening in that situation. Um, we all live our lives. We, we know how we see ourselves, correct? Um, and then sometimes that will clash about the way you're presented in a different light, right? In a, in a not to pick on media, but in some of the mass media format, it may not always be positive, right? It may highlight certain aspects of, of negativity. Um, that definitely impacts the way that the world will see you. It will also impact the way that you see yourself. Um, and so you begin to feel victimized. You begin to approach things differently. Uh, you begin not to feel in control of your destiny in some ways. Um, one thing that I pride myself on is all of my research I try to put it together for empowerment, right? I don't, especially coming from CDC, I don't want you to feel like the US government is telling you how to live your life. Absolutely not, absolutely not. I wanna inform you, right? So I wanna inform you to help you make your own positive decisions. I wanna give you the power to impact your health, right? So, and that goes over a lot of things. It's healthy um, lifestyle behaviors, um, screening for cancer and other diseases, um, healthcare, that's huge. Right? We shouldn't sit back and listen to a political fight over health care. We should know exactly what's included in our health care and how to approach it in our best interest. So you know, th that was a roundabout way of getting back to answer your question. It, it matters a lot. Um, we should make sure that we hold on to our own values and know how we see ourselves rather than you know, the way the portrait is painted by others for us. Dr. Reese, you have anything you want to add to that? Yeah, you know, I think that one of the things that's, that we have to communicate loudly to um, black men, black boys, black teens, is the value of black male life. Um, and we have to see that affirmed. Um, and so if the first three or four or five minutes are of, of, of violence, you know, the, the, you know, well, what can we do about that? Uh, and that is not the totality of who we are. And so the conversation becomes um, more than that 30 second sound bite, that's the story, um, because the vast majority of, of African American males aren't necessarily engaged in a, a negative behavior, um, et cetera. But I think we have to take ownership of the narrative that defines our life. And, and so I think the empowerment piece um, that you're, you're referring to is an important one and that we have to begin to act with a sense of agency. Um, and then we have to have our colleagues in the media um, be those agents at times when they say, you know what, I'm reporting the news, um, but I'm also a change agent. And here's one of the ways in which I serve as a change agent. And I think one of the things I would like to communicate is that all of us male, female, black, white, or, or whatever, are change agents. And the, the issue is, um, what do we want our communities and society to look like? Um, and then, depending on what that view is, you have an opportunity to be intentional with your behavior, mm -hmm. to affirm, um, in this case, the, the well-being and the value, more importantly, of black male life. That's very good. We, we are going to touch <coughs> on lifestyle uh, choices and so forth coming up. Dr. Kahn, yes. Yeah, I just wanted to say that there, there are also a lot of pos positive role models of young African-American males mm -hmm. who don't get the chance to be on the TV. I think we should be yes. talking more about them. I, for, for example, myself, before I came here to Clark Atlanta and start working with the African-American community, I lived a primarily white Lubbock, Texas. Mm -hmm. And I had no connection with the African-American male. Never met one. I mean, I'd seen them, but never got to know one. So all I was being fed was what was coming on the TV station. And that was my perception of an African-American male until I got here and found out what a wonderful place this is. So and how, what a wonderful people there. How much did that image change once it, you it met It does, every, as soon as you meet the first good kid, 
and you say, no, these are not like that, what, I, what I've been seeing on the TV. So I think there is a, there is a role for media too there to, to also highlight some of the positive things which are going on. Right. And DeMarco, I want to come <coughs> back to you in just a moment. Okay. We also want to explain how the news process works so you're not sending DeMarco <laughs> bad letters and telling him that he needs to be more <laughs> responsible. It's out of his hand. A producer actually puts that show together. DeMarco has nothing to do with it. His role yeah, no, is simply to present it. So please don't send him nasty letters. No, but so I'm saying, <laughs> I, I was talking in general, yes. the media always, you know, this is sensational news Very, and, and, yeah. and that, that's and what happened. And you know what, and we do have a say-so, we do have a say-so, but I, I think it's important for you all to hold us accountable. Mm -hmm. I tell my bosses all the time, and who knows how long I'll last in TV because I've always never had a problem with speaking up, but diversity is about more than just having a black face on television. Just right. because you see somebody black doesn't mean they are for us, right. mm -hmm. doesn't mean they're for yeah. our community. Preach. So you got to hold us accountable. you got to pick up the phone and say, hey, Brother, I've been calling you for three months and you haven't called me back. This is a big issue that affects mm -hmm. our community. What can you do about it? If you can't help me, I'll go elsewhere or I'll mm -hmm. call your general manager and say, hey, I'm calling DeMarco and he's not calling me back. And I can bet you $5 I'm going to pick up the phone and call you because that's that direct deposit that yeah. starts to get affected then. And also, DeMarco, talk a little bit, if you will. And Dr. Reagan, I do want to ask you, though, about media perception. Uh, in Jamaica and some of the other countries where there are large African uh, populations of men of African descent. So we're going to come back to this su subject as well. But while DeMarco is talking, um, who else uh, should people or can people reach out to in those newsrooms? Because there's more than just the people delivering the news. There are assignment editors, there are producers, there's a news director. So if they have a concern with how a certain community or certain stories are being portrayed, who would you recommend they send a letter to or reach out to? We have uh, producers. Uh, producers produce the shows, of course. They write uh, the shows. For the 11 o'clock, we have three or four producers. Uh, the 6 o'clock, uh, about the same amount. We have news directors, assistant news directors, uh, writers, uh, reporters. Anybody that you know inside of a TV station or a television network, reach out to them. Uh, if you can develop a relationship with one person, they should be able to get you to someone else. Uh, the anchors pretty much have some clout. Uh, in uh, managerial decisions as well and editorial decisions. So uh, if you know one, reach out to that person. Reach out to your Monica Pearsons and, mm -hmm. and stuff like that and say, hey, can you help me out with this? And they can usually go to the news director or the assignment editor and say, hey, can we get a photographer here? Or uh, they can go to uh, the vice president of community affairs upstairs and say, I think this, impo this is important that we build a relationship because we still have a responsibility uh, to the community aside from delivering and telling the news, we have to have a relationship uh, with mm -hmm. our community, and that's according to the FCC. Well, we have I mean, to follow rules, <laughs> a certain amount of things that we yeah. are supposed to be doing yeah. in the community, but people don't know about it, so they don't hold us accountable. And they may be coming from a perspective or a background similar to Dr. Khan. They may be they may be acting from a place of ignorance. So it's not as though they're trying to offend. It's simply they they simply may not know better. And so that engagement can be very helpful sometimes in enlightening them and, and helping them understand what areas are sensitive and how maybe to better phrase things in the future or handle a story. I say pick up the phone. Yeah. Uh, the days of mailing in letters and, and faxes. Those days are over with. Uh, even emails, because of the amount of emails that we get in a day, uh, people who want us to cover everything from a pumpkin patch to uh, an <laughs> investigation, a huge investigation, we get so much. We get press releases. Uh, I think pick up the phone and you call, mm -hmm. and they will send you straight to our voicemail. Uh, most of the time, they'll send you directly to us if they don't think you're crazy. But uh, they'll send you to us, and we'll mm -hmm. pick up the phone, and we'll eventually call you back. And sometimes, if somebody's calling over and over again, we're going to call you back because we want you to stop. So we're going to eventually <laughs> cave in and say, hey, when can I do the store? What do we need to be? But I, I think it's all about building that relationship. And if you have one voice inside of uh, the AJC, uh, WSB, uh, the Fox affiliate here, uh, ABC News, if you have one voice that you can reach, reach out to, you have sort of won half the battle. You won half the battle because a lot of people can't break into those doors. Yeah, very good. Well, Dr. Reagan, we want to get the perception. I see we have 60 seconds left in this in this section uh, or this segment. Um, but we would like to talk a little bit about the perception 
or the role the media plays, I guess, in some of the countries, other countries uh, besides America, uh, where there may be a large population of men of African descent. So if you want to start, and then when they wrap, we can come back to it okay. after the break. Um, I think there are some similarities um, in terms of that negative perception that's usually viewed. But I think the difference, um, at least when we speak about Caribbean nations, you're talking about a population where more than 90 percent are of African de descent. And so that tag, the black male, is not really the negative perception. It's mm -hmm. more socioeconomic status. Okay. That's so that's the, that's the real difference when, you know, in, in other countries um, because you don't have another race to compare to. Mm -hmm. you know. Oh, that's very good. Yes. So the diversity here actually is a factor that, that yeah. kind of yes. sets it apart. Yes. Very good. Well, we're going to be back in just a moment. And what we do, we're going to be considering lifestyle in the context of prostate cancer in men of African descent. And we're going to touch base a, a little bit more, ask Dr. Reagan to elaborate a little bit more as well on the role that uh, health care plays when it comes to men of African descent, uh, not only in the Caribbean countries, but in, uh, in here in the United States, as well as Dr. Underwood and Dr. Reese chiming in on that as well. How effective has the Affordable Care Act been, and are we seeing any differences, although it's very young, are we seeing any differences to note? We'll be right back. discussing the health of the black male and are extremely fortunate to be able to broaden our discussion today just a bit through the work of the Caribbean or African Caribbean Consortium, an organization founded by Dr. Camille Reagan, who joins us today as an expert, expert panelist. And thank you again, uh, all of our experts. You guys have, uh, it's been a wonderful conversation so far. And hopefully we can start covering some topics, including health care. Uh, and some of the other, I guess, uh, programs and, and initiatives that may be out there that, and, and, and as well as prostate cancer, because we know that that's a major issue for the CCRTD. But Dr. Reagan, if you could, for now, give us a little bit of information about the African Caribbean Consortium, and then anything that you're finding as it relates to African men, or men of African descent, and their, their health comparisons. Okay, so the African Caribbean Cancer Consortium uh, was founded several years ago, about eight years ago, primarily to sort of um, get a momentum going, um, more of a momentum, I should say, going with respect to um, research collaborations in populations of African ancestry. And so the, the organization has three distinct networks of researchers. There's a U.S. network, um, there's also a Caribbean network, and then there's an African network. And the, the, the framework in which we operate is such that the members, the researchers that make up this consortium are actually transdisciplinary. So there are many different um, medical research and health related fields represented. And the idea is that we can pull together to do team science um, and to look at these different black populations in a standardized way so that we can really begin to make some comparisons and try to understand the, the underpinnings of, you know, cancer in sport, in, uh, high incidence and mortality in, in these populations. Well, as we've seen, and, and, and I'm bringing in Ebola only because it kind of fits into the scheme of this discussion when it comes to health care and access to it. Uh, when you start doing those kind of comparisons, though, some of some of the resources that are available seems like they would they would factor in largely to the outcomes and the yields. Uh, how do you deal with that? And how do you address it to to help? I guess make certain that it's a balanced portrayal of what you're finding. Right. So that is a major limitation and a major problem, and I think that does contribute a lot to the disparities that you do see. Not just disparities across race, but even disparities across black populations. Um, you know, so it, the the incidence rates or mortality rates in the U.S. are not necessarily the same when you look at developing countries when you look at the black male. Um, mortality rates are much higher in developing countries and that ties in with health care. It ties in with um, limited access to certain parts of the populations, whether it's physical access because you have a lot of ru more rural than urban. Um, the ability to get to medical centers is a limitation um, and all of that contributes to health outcomes. Um, I don't know that we have a solution 
But of course, you know, we're, we're continuing to work um, through that process to try to tease out what are some of the barriers related to healthcare access and what are the, the other contributing factors that affect health outcomes. Well, and I think it's interesting as well, kind of like the CCRTD, and I don't know if we as a black community understand, and this is maybe an assumption, so please pardon me if it is, and if it's an unfair one especially, but it seems as though if we don't pick it up, it's not going to be picked up. Is that a fair assessment of what you're finding when it comes to dealing with African American health and making certain that research is done to find out, I guess, its entire, its profile, how it's impacting that that, that the body of that male of African descent or that woman of African descent? Dr. Reese, I see you kind of frowning yeah, and not certain. You know, it's not an academic exercise. Mm -hmm. There are people who will make their academic careers talking about disparities and um, that blacks die at higher rates for a variety of, of health outcomes, cancer sites, cardiovascular disease, diabetes, hypertension, et cetera. But when it's not your community, it, it, it's, it's a different piece. And so I don't think that the work is not being done, but I think the ownership of what happens next with the work mm -hmm. um, has to be ours. Um, we actually know how to reduce <coughs> what I'm going to call uh, preventable mortality. And, and so we're going to die. We don't have to die as young um, as we are dying. We don't have to die in some of the ways that we're dying. Um, but we know how to, to reduce cancer mortalities. We know how to reduce uh, cardiovascular deaths, et cetera. We have to get that out of the journals um, and into the communities. And in order to do that, we have, we have to own it. It has to find its way into our barbershops. Uh, increasingly, it has to find our way in, in our faith communities. Um, it has to find uh, its way on, on these campuses. Um, Spellman did something radical um, uh, several years ago where the president um, got rid of the athletic programs but started a health initiative uh, for black women there um, that everybody wants to be a part of. We, we have to be radical. Um, we have to be. And we have to do that with like-minded partners, whoever they might be. But it's, it's our health, it's our men, it's our community. Yeah, very good. Dr. Underwood, do you have any comments? I absolutely agree with everything you said. That's why I'm nodding over here. Um, dissemination is key. Ownership is key. He's right, this is not an academic exercise. When we find a health disparity, that's not just for the purpose of finding that health disparity. It's to then implement an intervention to reduce that health disparity. Um, that part rests with us, mm -hmm. correct? I mean, we can't wait on someone else to do it. We have to realize, I, th I think overall we've done a good job at identifying problems and providing more research into those issues. The part that we're slacking is actually the part where we take those findings build that into an intervention and then roll it out into our own communities and we have to be responsible for that. Yeah. yeah, I think a couple of years ago we did a town hall meeting here um, and, and the question was why the, the institutions like our institution, like uh, especially HBCUs, why are we not teaching health to our young men and women? Because that is it's the same man who's going to get a disease 20 mm -hmm. years down the road, but the lifestyles are made primarily when you're young. Mm -hmm. right? mm -hmm. So if you can yeah. educate especially people when they're college in college students, yes. especially Absolutely. among college Absolutely. students, if you're seeing unhealthy lifestyle behaviors among co college students, unhealthy diet, lack of physical activity, tobacco use, <coughs> these are the brightest and the you know these are the criminal crop. These are the brightest. These are the educated. What do we think is going on in the communities where they came from, right? So we have to start here. We have to use our, I mean, I'm a proud graduate of an HBCU. I know all the power behind HBCUs. We have to utilize those HBCUs. Oh, well, and it <clears throat> seems, too, that, you know, this is, a, to me, a very powerful representation of the next level. It is the African Caribbean Consortium. Uh, an organization founded to go in and say, hold on a moment, I'm going to take ownership of finding out what these factors are and how they are, they're, they're, how they're connected. It's looking at Morehouse School of Medicine and saying, hey, listen, we can train and educate our own doctors. It's looking at the CCRTD and saying, hey, hold on a moment, that prostate cancer that's impacting the black male, that's something that may have some factors in it that the general studies may not right. find, so we're going to put right. our energy and money to it. Right. How close are we? To 
to getting our young people to understand this is something, this is a new way of looking at health in the terms of solving, of bringing solutions to the table so that there is something of ownership in that capacity. How close are we to that, do you believe? How close? I, I can't tell you, but I can tell you that this will, I, th I, I, I like that you pointed out how close we just help, you know, having the young people take ownership. I think it starts with the older people in a lot of ways, okay. right? I think there's, there's a collaboration between the two. So you painted a beautiful picture there. Basically, HBCUs is being the catch-all for what the institutions are missing. And those of us who go to or went to HBCUs, that's how they originated. Mm -hmm. It was a catch-all, mm -hmm. right? So the mm -hmm. academic, you know, education system that existed at one time in this country did not capture all of those Americans. HBCU stepped in and filled the void. In a lot of ways, we need HBCUs to step in again and fill the void. What better place to begin research on smoking behaviors among young black men, um, diabetes, uh, early, early diabetes predictors among young black women, any other issues among black populations, what better place than HBCUs? Yeah. And, you, and we've discussed or touched on it very uh, lightly, but lifestyle. Uh, choices mm -hmm. and getting that behavior to change. There was a statistic that I found on the CC, uh, the CD, the CDC that actually showed a decrease in the percentage of young black males smoking, the, the, the smoking rate, and I think it went down several percentage points. It was like a little bit more than a four percentage point decrease uh, over a period of eight to ten years, which I thought was very, uh, I guess, very positive as well as very encouraging as far as that trend. Um, how do we take that and, and make it progress in that right direction? What's, what's more to do? Dr. Reese. So one of the things I think you have to do, using that example, is you have to understand what explains that downward trend. Um, was it uh, the result of community-based or campus-based or some combination of interventions? Was it um, that smoking is less in vogue now, which it is less in vogue now. It's, um, we have uh, greater numbers of smoke-free um, uh, communities, et cetera. What explains that? Because if we understand that, then we can talk about how do we take this to a broader scale? Um, and then we look for those other um, examples. We're, we're working on a project at, at Morehouse where we're looking at trends in, 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 in cancer mortality. And we've identified one uh, using county level data that talks about um, converging towards health equity, uh, which means that the rates of mortality are coming down. Um, and when we get to optimal, that's when the rates are below the national average. Well, what's important is that we're going to then go into those communities where that's happening to understand what those communities did um, to, to decrease that mortality rate so that we can then share it with other communities across the country and help them build the capacity to do those kinds of things. Um, but the, the change process is, 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 can be a slow process, but it, it's, it's a, I mean, if, if you look at major um, health indicators, they've been going down for, for years. Um, but I liken it, you know, being ahead, light years ahead, but still being in the dark ages, you're still in the dark ages, and so mm -hmm. we have a lot of work yet to do. Um, but I think there's some things we should be encouraged by. We just need to embrace it and push the agenda. I think that one of the things that the Marco said is about how we hold people accountable. Mm -hmm. uh, we have to hold our elected officials accountable, too, because um, all the tax dollars that go to pay for the research that's finding these things, um, you need to be asking the question. We need to be asking the question. Why aren't these findings being returned to our communities to actually improve our health? I don't, I don't want to hear about um, that we know how to reduce uh, cancer mortality for breast, prostate, colorectal, um, if in my community those rates aren't going down. Yeah, that makes sense. We also want to point out, uh, and I failed to do this earlier, uh, we have a live audience. So if anybody has any questions, please come to the mic. We welcome your uh, your interaction as well as your engagement. And uh, if you'll come to the mic here to the right of the stage, we'll be happy to entertain your question and make certain our panelists um, will engage, engage you as well. So when looking at... Um, I, I found it interesting that DeMarco at 35 uh, had a, a measure of fear when thinking about that prostate exam, and we're going to get back to prostate cancer for just a moment. How important is it, and I guess what approach needs to be taken now with this next generation, because they have garnered so much. I mean, our children are more educated. Uh, we are probably more more present in corporate America than we ever have been in the history of this country. 
And so while health continues to be a, a, an issue, there is great promise in that you do have a room of, of healthy, vibrant young intellectuals who are going into a more promising future. How do we get them to pick up health and make certain that that digital rectum exam is not keeping them from going <laughs> and seeing the doctor on a regular basis? I, I think that one of, one of the things behind what he uh, was describing is youth, right? Mm -hmm. So, you know, 35 in, from a public health perspective is actually pretty young, mm -hmm. right? Um, and we would, we would kind of uh, include that into a, almost like a younger adult subgroup, mm -hmm. correct? Mm -hmm. So <clears throat> we're very aware that younger adults um, a lot of times do not keep up with screening, do not make regular visits to, um, see primary care physicians, we're also aware that a lot of younger adults do not even have health insurance, right? Mm -hmm. So that, that's one of the highest, I believe it's that group, um, 18 to 35, that you know, we're really you know, p going after to boost healthcare enrollment. So in some ways, what he described is almost indicative of what we're seeing in generally across the entire country, not just within the black community. I I'll, I'll let's say that one first. Um, however, to Dr. Khan's point, um, given the disparity within the black community, we need to make a better effort Mm -hmm. to know that 35 actually is not very young for mm -hmm. prostate cancer um, screening when you're a black male. Very good. We have a question now. If you'll please give us your name and yes. state your question. Uh, good afternoon. Thank you guys for being here. My name is Oliver Richmond. I am a first year graduate student in the Department of Biology at Clark Atlanta University. Um, you guys have actually delivered to us today a lot of knowledge, um, at which point I was actually interested in asking if our community were more preventative based or treatment based, but you guys have kind of done a great job of showing or explaining to me that we, ha we seem to have a dual purpose where it is both preventative based and treatment based at the mm -hmm. same time. But what I'm here to ask you then is as a first year graduate student, um, how could you guys equip me or, or task me to better serve my community um, with more revolutionary, more revolutionary um, advances for detection uh, better than the DRE, the digital rectal exam or chemotherapy um, as a treatment or uh, radiation as a treatment or um, because this is inner city where we are, where mm -hmm. we're based. Um, we don't have room for farmland where we can control the things that, goes into, that go into our soil, things like that. So other than education and um, pulling together the community, what is it that I can do as a first year graduate student? in my community. It's a very powerful question. We have about two minutes, so whoever wants to start, we can come back to it if we don't, don't finish all of it. I'll start. Okay. Um, I mean, I think the, the fact that you're asking the question, um, be an advocate, um, be a change agent, um, take care of yourself. These are things, and then talk to your peers about are they taking care of themselves. Talk to your family members about whether they're taking care of themselves. Talk to your extended family. Tell them talk to their extended family members. Think about the organizations that you're a part of. You know, are you in a fraternity? Are you, are you um, a mason? You know, are they talking about those things in, in, in those places? The, the conversation, um, and, and, and remind them that talk is, is insufficient, absent action. Um, I think that the, the other part of that is, you know, how do we bring knowledge of those cutting edge interventions to bear in our communities? You know, be, be, be choiceful about what you do with your career. You mm -hmm. said you're a graduate student, you know, in, in, in biology, what are you gonna do? That's my question to you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, I'm gonna hold myself accountable, actually. Um, so first and foremost, I will always be a representation of my work. So the health component is there, um, but it goes beyond myself. So the people that I associate myself with, I also hold them accountable. <clears throat> and it's not enough for me to just understand this information or to have garnered this information, but I must freely share it and give it away. And so it goes more be well beyond educating myself. I have, to, I have to educate the people around me. And sometimes educating those people around me um, is more than just talk or more than just showing a, a typical experience or interpreting a publication that I may have been a part of. Um, but a change in diet or a change of lifestyle or mm -hmm. removing that individual from the incidences of exposure that probably would in make them indicative of receiving pro prostate cancer in the first mm -hmm. place. And not just prostate cancer, but all diseases mm -hmm. and things like, uh, to that nature. So. You know, actually, um, I would, we, we've not touched on this at all, but I actually think that, that one of the things, you know, what can you do? We have to ha also have the uncomfortable and hard conversations. Um, we, we need to start talking about HIV more in our communities. We need to talk about um, those men who have sex with men and those men who have sex with men and women. Uh, 
some of this is, is it becomes an intellectual exercise. You know, we can talk about these these things, but when we talk about behavior change, um, we, we we also have to have those hard conversations that are uncomfortable. Um, that also ex are responsible for a lot of premature um, mortality. And and and, and so, um, as I as I look at you as a young man, um, and that those things are impacting young people more, that's that's I I, I charge you with that. Push that envelope. I can do that. Thank you. Thank you. Well, and, and I think, you know, it was very interesting because I think sometimes, too, especially with youth, there's this notion of invincibility, mm. uh, exemption, and exception. Right. And sometimes those can be very costly and deadly assumptions to make. And so uh, hopefully these kind of forms can help young people realize that this issue is real. It's not something that just like you would call it Dr. Reese, an intellectual exercise. It's coming from need. Uh, and, and severe, dire statistics that says there are real problems out there that need to be addressed. So when we come back, we're going to talk a little bit more about the black male health, how it ranks in our nation as well as across the globe. Uh, and then we're going to also so uh, touch a little bit on prostate cancer, and then we're going to take a look, if we can, at the Affordable Care Act and see how well it's doing in our community. We'll be right back. Welcome back to the CCRTD's town hall meeting, an annual event that takes place usually most Novembers or each November. And today we're discussing the health of the black male. And we're joined by a wonderful panel of experts, Dr. John Michael Underwood, Dr. Camille Reagan, Dr. Leroy Reese, and Dr. Shafiq Khan. And if we can now, because I, we kind of touched on it throughout, but let's talk a little bit about health care and access to it. How important, how important is it? Uh, in changing and solving the major issues of health that we're seeing in the black community. And Dr. Reagan, if you want to um, I think uh, health care access will, changing health care access or improving health care access will make a major impact in increasing or improving health outcomes. But I don't know that that's the entire solution. Mm -hmm. Um, because you can have access to something but not utilize the mm -hmm. access. Mm -hmm. And so, and in the same way, having knowledge does not change behavior. Um, so I think um, it is a major component that we do need to address, but it goes way beyond that. What are some of the other factors? Oh, lifestyle, um, mm -hmm. whether it be cultural, um, diet, you know, some of the other things that we've talked about, physical activity and so on, or even the environment. Mm -hmm. um, different types of environmental exposures can increase your wish risk for many different types of conditions or diseases. And so having um, that ability to look at all of that in its entirety and how they all interconnect mm -hmm. is really the way I think to go about trying to solve the issue. I'm um, not looking at one thing as the major component, but really looking at the interconnectedness of everything else. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Dr. Underwood, did you have something I to add? I completely agree with, doctor, with what Dr. Reagan said. Um, access to quality health care makes a huge difference. Um, after that, we know that we need to then take it the next level. Um, I would actually begin with navigating your health care system, right? So, <clears throat> the state of Massachusetts actually passed um, universal health care coverage <coughs> years ago, right? Um, the first thing they saw was what we're seeing here, right? So the rate of the uninsured actually begins to, cl to decline, um, and the cost of health care also declines. Two very good things. That's actually why the Affordable Care Act was um, really thought of, right, in its, in its early, early inception. Um, however, though they passed universal health care, they saw the cost come down, they saw the uninsured rates also d go down, they still saw these persistent disparities, right? unfortunately again within communities of color and they realized that it was because people were not able to then navigate the healthcare system right where okay well I have health insurance great where do I go how do I sign up to go see my primary care physician when they tell me to do something right how do I follow up with them and you know make sure that I'm staying on track how do I know when to go to see a specialist versus when to go see my primary care um, what if I'm not able to afford 
uh, my pharmaceutical prescription that they um, written <coughs> for me. So yes, healthcare is going to make a huge impact. We're already seeing that it's making a huge impact. We have to start thinking about the next levels after that. Mm -hmm. Dr. Reese, do you have anything you want to add? A, a, a couple of things. I want to one echo what you said about quality healthcare. Uh, one of the things that we know is, or that we have evidence of, is that um, the quality of health care that poor communities receive mm -hmm. is sometimes uh, not of, of, of the same quality that more affluent um, communities receive. And we even see some of that um, across uh, socioeconomic groups, um, between groups. So you will have middle class African Americans receiving less aggressive, uh, thorough, comprehensive care as their white counterparts. And, and, and so the quality piece becomes very important. And I think that, that that's, there's an ethical uh, mandate around that piece. Um, but the, the navigation piece, um, that as we try to build on what you said about having access, but then the utilization, when you um, are diagnosed with cancer, prostate, breast, you often are assigned what's called a, a patient navigator to help you navigate that process. We're gonna um, help you get uh, through your screenings, your follow-ups, um, any treatments, we're then going to follow up. We're going to make sure that you have the psychosocial support that you need to get through your, your treatment regimen. Well, for communities that historically have not either had access to health care or who have underutilized um, their access to health care, sometimes because that, that access is, you know, 30 miles away. Um, I think that idea of navigation is, is, is a nice analogy, putting in place navigators to help those communities learn how to do all the things that you were talking about in terms of navigating that process. That's something that we could do that would then um, see some of those more intractable disparities perhaps um, dissipate because people would know how to, to navigate that, that, that process. I mean, I think about the conversations I have with my mom. Well, she, she picks up the phone and calls me. Well, the doctor said X, Y, and Z. Well, what, what do you think I should do? And then between me and my sister, we help her figure it out. Not everybody is in that, in that position, um, and, and, so, and so we have to close that gap. Right. Go ahead. Well, Dr. I think that, that many times we, we, we have the health care and we, we have access to health care too, but many times we don't look at some of the other intangibles. Like, how is that person going to get to that place? Can they afford to drive? Can mm -hmm. they have transportation? I mean, we have had been guilty of that. We, we, we put up a screening somewhere for prostate cancer but we want people to come, but they cannot mm. walk to that. Right. I mean, so there, 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 are, there are all those factors mm -hmm. play into that. So just having mm. access to health uh, or having health care is not always enough. So it, it I think we need to do more. Uh, we need to do more. The poverty is, to me, mm -hmm. uh, one of the major driving factors in the health. And I think right. we, we haven't touched on that, right. but I would like to, you guys to touch. And you're more expert. Yeah. Right. Well, as you mentioned that, you know, thinking about the working poor, um, who uh, can't afford to take off a day of work yeah. to go sit at the clinic all day to be seen. Um, but Grady's Clinic may be open from eight to, eight to six. Um, so, but if we had a clinic that was open to midnight, yeah. that person might be able to get to a clinic and, and, and be seen. So I, I think we have to um, think about improving health is, is not a nine to five job um, and, and think out of the box as, as I think Dr. Khan is, is, is suggesting. Right. When you hear these discussions, Dr. Reagan, and, you, and you, you've seen these other African uh, populations of African descent, in a way it seems like we would sit pretty uniquely among them. Uh, how far are these kind of systems from their reach? I mean, I, I guess as I was listening to us discuss getting populations to these centers, a, a question I just thought, you know, in some of these populations you're seeing, they don't even have the centers. Yes, and, and it's not equally the same across, you know, different communities. Um, it, it varies because there are some islands, for example, that have very good health care um, structures and, and, and health care access is, is equally available to everyone, um, but yet you don't see them, persons utilizing that access. There are some countries that have universal health care, others that do not, others that have maybe two cities in, on the entire island and the rest of the island is rural. And we're talking about rural roads where you may have to walk a couple miles to get a bus to get to the, the, the center. Um, and so there are a little bit more challenges that, um, that have to be dealt with. 
um, beyond simply just patient navigation. Um, and that ties into poverty to some extent. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, not, you know, when you, when you go out into the communities and you talk to people and you tell them about healthy lifestyles and th these are the things that you need to eat and the way you should prepare your foods, you're not mindful of, or most of us are not even thoughtful of the fact that they may have this information but may not necessarily be able to afford to eat that way or to afford the healthy foods that they're supposed to be eating or afford to be able to prepare their meals in a way that is more healthier. So it, it, it is challenging and there are lots of layers that we have to peel off um, when, when, we come, when we think about developing countries and every country is unique mm -hmm. in itself. When looking at uh, the issue of poverty, especially in the black community, working for the CDC, uh, Dr. Underwood, do are these discussions part of the dialogue that takes place in such a powerful center? I mean, that's an institution of international repute. I mean, mm -hmm. it stands tall among all, most of the foremost institutions of the world. Are we on their table? And Absolutely. Is poverty something Absolutely. that's discussed? Socioeconomic status is, is huge, and it's growing profile, um, not just within CDC, but you know, within other public health agencies, within medical schools, within other research centers. We are, we are finally realized that socioeconomic status is a major factor um, playing within a lot of the racial disparities that we see, right? So when you talk about um, black populations and health, you cannot talk about health disparities if you're not also going to address socioeconomic status, mm -hmm. right? Because a lot of times our community is more adversely affected, right? So yes, looking at the uh, socioeconomic status in the context of race and then individually, independently, how does socioeconomic status affect health care? That is an ongoing conversation. There's lots of research. Um, there is an annual publication that's released. I think the last one came out in late 2013, so it should be coming out again, which is a collaboration between CDC and National Center for Health, health Statistics, um, looking at the impact of socioeconomic status in health. Um, socioeconomic status, in a lot of ways, is what drove the Affordable Care Act. Right? So, you know, trying to make sure that um, the most vulnerable parts of our population who literally cannot afford health care had quality health care or were provided some sort of quality health care service. Um, and that's also at play. So, yeah, I definitely think that, you know, it, it's gaining traction even as we sit here today. Um, and a lot of people realize that it's a very, very major uh, issue within health care. That's very good. What about the Affordable Care Act, Dr. Reese? How effective, how effective has it been? And I know it's still young. Uh, and what are, what's the promise for, for even, I guess, uh, further help? So I think the promise is tremendous. Mm -hmm. um, it, 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 the, the Affordable Care Act is perhaps the most important piece of civil rights legislation to be passed in, in, in decades. And, and I see it as a, a civil rights um, <coughs> issue. Um, it, 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 in the ideal, makes affordable and accessible health care to previously uninsured populations. Um, and I think, going back to our conversation about navigation, if we can get people enrolled in the Affordable Care Act, that uh, the opportunity to reduce and to eliminate some disparities is real, mm -hmm. it's tangible. I mean, it's, it's like the HPV vaccine. If we know that we can, you know, essentially eradicate disparities in cervical cancer if, if we get young people vaccinated. So um, I think the, the opportunity is, 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 is huge. I think that um, the, the part of it is, is we have to get mobilized. Um, in 2008 when President Obama was elected the first time, you, you saw the greatest turnout in black voters ever. And, 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 and so they, they weren't talking about it, they actually acted on it. They went to the polls and they voted. And so we need that same kind of campaign, if you will, to get people enrolled um, through the Affordable Care Act and then to get them, and we need to help them identify primary care docs, which means that um, places like where I work, where we are the National Center for Primary Care, we then have to reach out to primary care physicians to go into these communities to make themselves available um, to, to these previously uninsured people. And we have to start building relationships because one of the things that was made reference to earlier, I believe by DeMarco, is that doctor-patient relationship. And so we have to start building relationships so that the 
the promise of the Affordable Care Act can be realized. Yeah, very good. Well, it's hard to believe, but we're at the end of our 90-minute program. Um, and so as we approach our last five minutes, I would love for you each just to, uh, if you have a, a particular message that you would like to deliver, um, or what do you feel is the most important message you could deliver to our audience today? If you'd please share that, and we have about five minutes, so if we could maybe take a minute each, that would be wonderful. Dr. Underwood, let me start with you. Sure, I'll go first. Um, uh, if there were one thing to take away, earlier Oliver had a really good question, and it was, what can I do? And as I watched him talk, you know, like 10, 15 more years ago, I was in his situation. And, you know, what, well, what would I tell myself then, right? Um, I think he got great advice, be an advocate, right? Be a change agent. Um, spread information about preventative health, preventative health care, right? So um, treatment is kind of a next level thing. You know, you don't want to face that, but we can all do things to modify our um, lifestyle behaviors. We can all do things as far as screening. We can all do those kind of preventive health things, those basic public health things. Um, I would actually advise you to um, work with different public health groups. You, you sit in Atlanta, Georgia, home to ACS and CDC and all these other great institutions, Morehouse School of Medicine, Emory, you know, volunteer with some public health groups. Um, get involved with preventive care. Um, that's how I think that you can actually make the most change in your current position. Very good. Dr. Reagan. Um, I, I think, well, I actually would say that I was going to say exactly <laughs> that, <laughs> but I guess I have to change it up a bit. <laughs> um, I, I, for me, I think the major thing, message to, to, to disseminate is this importance of being that agent for change mm -hmm. and the fact that we as black individuals need to take ownership of what we see and ownership in terms of um, thinking of how we live our lives um, to, be, to, to try to think to be more impactful in what we do. As a young person um, going to graduate school or you know, developing their career, trying to think about what it is that they're going to be spending the rest of their lives doing, think impact. Mm -hmm. you know, and, 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 and that I think, you know, if we begin to get a, a, a large number of persons being raised up in that like-mindedness, then we can begin to start seeing some change. That's very good. Dr. Reese. So they both took what I was going to say. <laughs> um, but um, traditions start today. Mm. Um, behavior change starts today. Uh, the, the health of, of the black man in this country matters. Um, it is a liberation act for us to be healthy. Um, it, it, it undergirds the stability of our communities um, and our families. And so we have to be intentional about promoting it. Um, find like-minded partners, work with them. Um, don't be satisfied. Hold yourself accountable and hold others accountable. Um, and revisit this topic. Don't let this be a conversation that you had today what did I do yesterday at, at one o'clock? Let's let's not do that. Let's uh, let's be the change. Amen. Okay. I'm I'm sorry. I thought I hey, took you know, as a preacher. Very good, Doctor Khan. Yeah. I, first of all, I want to thank my colleagues here for coming and and joining us today. I'm part host, first panel member, and I want to thank you for doing this for the seventh year in a row. I think what I would like to say is that there has to be more engagement, not just at that level, but where my colleagues are saying, although I wanted to say what all three of them <laughs> said. <laughs> but I think that when we were talking about Affordable Health Act and, and Obamacare, what it's called, the only thing you know in public discourse is negativity. Mm -hmm. Everybody is shouting at the top of their voice that we have to repeal it and we have to get rid of it. But there is nobody, there is nobody outraged and saying, no, this helps mm -hmm. me, this yeah. helps mm -hmm. this country, this mm -hmm. helps this poor people in this country. We need to keep it. I want you to go on the street and say we want it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I think we're about to start a rally. Right, right, right. <laughs> I, 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 would, I would advise take ownership in the name, yeah. right? So. When we spoke before, uh, the word Obamacare came up. It, it always confused me that people don't like that name. Right. I would own that name. I would own it. Mm -hmm. Own the name. And yes, that's helped. exactly it what it is. If you, you voted for the man, we put him in for a change, and he made that change, own the name. But the only people who want it to be repealed and who are going to benefit from it is who have been making money on right. your health. 
and right. and now when when you have a chance to change that yeah. don't let it go back you should be outraged and you should try to stop it yeah. and especially young people it's a great thing. Yeah. <laughs> all that good energy right, yeah. Yeah. right. Yeah. right. well dr underwood dr reagan dr reese and of course dr dr khan <laughs> uh, we thank you for joining us today we thank you as well for your heart we thank you for the work that you do and we thank you for your care because none of those can be taken for granted so we hope that this forum was meaningful for you as well as for our audience as ho at home uh, and here in the studios and we want to remind you that the CCRTD is actually active throughout the year and trying to keep the community informed they actually have a wonderful radio show that airs every third Wednesday from 6 to 7 on WCLK and you can listen in tonight actually uh, they cover a range of topics and they also air a wonderful monthly program on WCAU TV called Life Notes and all of it's about keeping the community informed and engaged in health topics and uh, advances so we hope that you'll stay connected to the CCRTD. Also visit their website. They have wonderful resources there. Uh, and we'd also like to encourage you to stay in contact with our wonderful panelists uh, and make certain too that you're accessing as much information as currently as possible that you can to stay healthy. Again, on behalf of the CCRTD, Dr. Khan and the rest of his staff, as well as CAU TV, we thank you for joining us today and we hope this has been a meaningful conversation and we look forward to your healthy future. Thank you.